certainly my pleasure to join you today. I, uh, I don't know about the description of being an expert in health care. My primary job is to deal with legislators and uh, state officials. And uh, I usually see myself talking to an audience of uh, people, well-intentioned legislators, but who are much less knowledgeable than myself, who spent 30 years working in health care and have been honored to represent hospitals all those times. I look at an audience like this and I realize I feel a little humbled that such a distinguished audience and clearly the knowledge base out there is, is substantial. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, whatever little I can share with you today, uh, I hope it's helpful. I want to um, thank you for taking the time uh, for Dr. Coble and his leadership and for each and every one of you taking the time to invest in your community. Healthcare uh, is very complex, as you know. Solutions are very difficult. They're not easy ones. There's some out there, but they're very difficult to uh, uh, implement, and it takes sacrifices from all segments of our society to accomplish things that uh, uh, we need to accomplish. And, and I believe, I'm a strong believer that, that solutions and impacts and develop locally first. It's groups like this who can get together and collaborate and then start to talk to policymakers to impact uh, what goes on in both Tallahassee and in D.C. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and start. I, my plan is to talk about uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then we have some other distinguished uh, 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 CEOs who are in the front line who on a daily basis obviously operate and deal with some of the challenges that I'm going to outline for you today. Um, let me tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, if I can make, here we go. Um, the, uh, the Safety Net Hospital Alliance was created about seven years ago. Um, uh, it represents uh, a small group of hospitals, the six large teaching hospitals, uh, the major public hospital systems in the state of Florida, the, uh, the uh, two uh, standalone licensed children's hospitals. There's certainly a lot of children's hospitals represented within those other hospitals also. Uh, some of the distinguishing characteristics, this group, about 10% of the hospitals in the state, do about 40% of the charity care. Uh, but having said that, I, I want to recognize from the onset that all hospitals do charity care. And there's also a lot of hospitals that do a substantial amount of charity care that are not on this list. But I think this represents a core group of hospitals that have a disproportionate burden. And that's the point we tried to make in developing this organization and in terms of having a, a central voice for financing issues and for funding issues and access issues to the uninsured. The, uh, the other characteristic, significant characteristics about our group is that um, we are 80% um, of graduate medical education is done at these 15 institutions. Actually, 70, 70%, 80% of the GME in the state, 70% of it is at three institutions, Shands Jacksonville, Shands Gainesville, and Jackson Memorial. Uh, represents three quarters of the regional perinatal intensive care centers in the state. 66% uh, of the trauma center admissions, 100% of level one trauma centers in the state, 66% of organ transplants and practically all the burn units. And I'm, a, I'm very proud to represent them and uh, as I had said, they share, uh, there's a lot of other hospitals that share their significant problems as we move forward. This pie chart is we, we talked about, Dr. Wilson mentioned the different models in healthcare and how to pay for uh, how societies around the country pay for uh, healthcare and how they deliver healthcare. And I always, 
I always la and that those were very, very uh, on target, uh, very uh, uh, interesting and informative facts. I always find them a little humorous because most Americans, and in fact most policymakers I deal with, don't realize that we're very close to those models today. And this pie chart shows that. Now, I have to, I have to footnote that statement with, I'm talking from a hospital perspective. As you go to different segments of the healthcare delivery system, you know, pharmaceutical, um, you know, uh, nursing home care, whatever, you may see a different mix of this. But from a hospital perspective, it is somewhat frightening when you look at what the payer mix of hospitals are today. You go on that pie chart. This represents all Florida hospitals, and it represents the type of payers that are in those hospitals. And you will notice that obviously Medicare represents over half the patient days in hospitals. The second largest, 20%, is commercial insurers. The third is Medicaid at 17%. Then you have the self-pay, and then you have other governmental is um, the uh, really federal programs like the military programs. Uh, the self-pay, I should underscore, those are really no pay. Those are really your charity care and bad debt. Take a look at this chart and add up Medicare, governmental sponsored, Medicaid, governmental sponsored, and self-pay and other governmental. 80% of the patients in hospitals today are either uninsured or the vast majority of the 80% are in a governmental sponsored program. Those governmental sponsored programs are n the prices paid to hospitals are not set in the free market. There's no supply and demand curve that's setting a price. There's no negotiations. In some cases, I should take that a footnote. In some cases with HMOs, there is some negotiations, but it's limited by the amount of money that's put into the system. These are fixed payers. These are governmental sponsored programs. And that's what exists today. So hospitals, I, when I talk to legislators, particularly legislators who are businessmen, they, they, this, and it should change their perspective on why government and what government does is so important to the financial viability of our institutions. Because how would you like to run a business, I say, where 80% of your, of your uh, customers basically tell you what they're going to pay you? It doesn't matter how much it costs you. It doesn't matter uh, whether you want to sell to them or not. Anyways, that's that's... That's, I think, that if I had one chart to show you, it would have been this one. And, the, and I won't spend as many times on the other slide, much, much time on the other slides. But the next, I'm going to do two more pie charts. This one is the same pie chart as the first one, but this looks at the safety net hospitals, that group of hospitals that we highlighted in the first pie chart. And while the first pie chart, I think, represents a real challenge to all hospitals. In this second pie chart, what you see for these safety nets is you see that Medicaid, which is, and we'll get to that in a little bit, is a very poor payer, does not cover cost. Medicaid, uh, the percentage of the patient caseload is up. Uh, it, goes from, it goes to 26.6% which is 9.3% higher than the average hospitals. You look at the self-pay, and it goes to 9.1% or almost 3% higher than the, uh, than the average. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing a shifting of patients, a larger amount of charity patients, a larger amount of Medicaid patients in these safety net hospitals. Then thirdly, is the payer mix for Shands at Jacksonville, which is uh, one of the issues we wanted to talk about today. And even within that safety net mix of hospitals, you can see the very challenging payer mix that 
your uh, uh, teaching hospital here in Jacksonville is facing. What happens is the Medicaid uh, uh, goes is almost twice the level. It is twice the level of the average hospital at 36 percent. The self-pay is twice the level of the average hospital in the state. Uh, and commercial drops to 10 percent. And in fact, just adding these numbers back up, as I did for the first pie chart, in this case, 90 percent of the patients are governmental sponsored or uninsured. And within the governmental sponsor portion, a bigger part of that is Medicaid, which is a much poorer payer than Medicare is. Um, I want to just cover, I'm going to now focus a little bit, a couple slides on Medicaid, um, primarily because it is a critical part of the, the, the payment system. Uh, it's certainly going, one of our most significant challenges in, in finding, uh, uh, helping hospitals maintain their financial viability. I'm not going to get into the you know, Affordable Health Care Act and the good parts and the bad parts of it, but I am going to mention just a few things because it is a very important part of what's happening in health care. To, to debate the Obamacare would take a lot more time than you have scheduled today, or for me to talk anyways. Right now, enrollment in our state is 3.3 million people. 17% of the people in, uh, in our state are, are Medicaid, they receive their health insurance through the Medicaid program. Um, when, if, uh, under ACA, and if our state chooses to expand Medicaid, as you all know, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the mandate, but then said the states have the option of expanding the Medicaid program, which is one of the elements of that program, fully implemented, it would bring in 910,000 patients. Uh, so we've got 19 million people in the state. Uh, fully implemented, uh, Medicaid would be covering 4.2 million people or more than one out of every five Floridians, between one out of every five and one out of every four Floridians. That's pretty significant. And uh, it's significant today, and it's likely to become more significant in the future. The, who is Medicaid? Um, this, I, I always find this table really um, uh, fascinating because um, if you look on the left bar chart, that shows you the distribution of the demographics or the patient mix. In essence, 17 percent of the people in Medicaid are adults today non-pregnant uh, adults, well, it could be pregnant adults, excuse me, adults. Then you have 50 percent, over half the program is children, 18 percent is blind and disabled, and 14 percent is elderly. Um, if you look at the way those dollars are expended, however, you can see that while the blind and disabled and the elderly represent about one-third of the enrollment, they represent about two-thirds of the expenditures. So when we start talking about cutting Medicaid, we're talking about cutting services to blind and disabled and elderly people, because those are the people who need the services the most, who utilizes the services the most. Now, I want to make a point on children. Children are cheap, healthy children, in terms of to care for them. They're usually healthy. They don't require, they utilize a lot of health care resources. That's why you see, even though they represent 50% of the, of the caseload, only 29% of the expenditures. If you're a safety net hospital, or if you're a children's hospital like Wolfson, you're not getting the normal healthy patients. You're getting very sick patients. And what you're also getting is on those pie charts, if I had pulled out a pie chart just for children's hospitals, where we saw 27 percent was Medicaid in children's hospitals, it's probably around 65 percent. 
because the eligibility for children is a lot more lenient, and, and that's why you have a lot more children get their coverage through that. So if you're a children's hospital, you're looking at 65% of your payer mix is coming from government, the, the worst paying governmental program, Medicaid. Very, very challenging. Well, what does that, what does that kind of mean? Well, I, didn't ha I don't have enough time today to kind of break, uh, to, to go through every component of the funding mechanisms uh, that the sa and the challenges that the safety net hospitals face. But I think it's fair to say Medicaid is a very significant part of this payer mix that safety nets and other hospitals are facing. What you have on this chart just shows you the cuts that the legislature has taken in the Medicaid program over the last eight years. Now I have to, I have to highlight the fact that even without these cuts, even without these cuts, the state would only be paying about 65% of cost for Medicaid reimbursement. So they'd all, still be paying significantly less than, not the charges, but the cost of providing the care. Why did they take these cuts? Did they take them because they, we found some good cost containment measures that would reduce your ability to reduce the resources that you use to care for the Medicaid patient? Did they find ways to keep people out of the hospitals? No. They took these cuts because we're in a budget crisis and because they, they have issues unrelated to health care like public school funding and university funding and other very critical component parts of our state budget system. But there's not a relationship between these cuts and any type of best practices and delivery of health care. These are just cuts. This Take them. We have to balance the budget. Everybody has to take their fair share of cuts. People who represent the universities in this room understand, I'm sure, what I'm talking about. So, the, but it has impact when, you're, when you don't have choices of taking patients and you have to, uh, and you're getting paid less than cost, uh, this continues to uh, uh, challenge us and make it more difficult. The next chart uh, just takes those cuts for eight years and shows you for the um, uh, entire state, for all the hospitals, it was $1.1 billion. For Shands at Jacksonville, it represents $30 million. That's $30 million of recurring, recurring expenditures. It's the cumulative effect, but now that's the amount that's being reduced every year for, um, uh, for the hospital. The next chart um, shows that what the state is currently paying relative to cost, including those cuts, and without using any local taxes. Right now, inpatient care is being reimbursed on the fee-for-service side about 39% of our cost. Now, some of that is made up from communities who have local taxes who contribute that on behalf of their hospitals. In that case, Duval is one, Dade County is the largest, it's $300 million from Dade County is being contributed through ad valorem taxes primarily. But even when you add those local taxes, we're falling way short of the cost of health care. And if you look just at the state taxes and the federal share associated with those state taxes, the state's paying 39% of cost. And I'm nearing conclusion here, and hopefully I will have stayed within my limit. Um, this, what are some of the challenges that we're going to face? This is, a, we've faced a lot up to now, and we have a, 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 a game board which uh, has a lot of hurdles on it that we're going to have to meet. Um, well, you've got additional cuts that you could see. Uh, the legislature's already done eight years of cuts. They could cut Medicaid even further. I, um, I would just, I, I think it, it's important to note that while we support, certainly support coverage for all, safety net hospitals support coverage for all Floridians. 
I'm, I'm not suggesting there are good things and bad things about the Medicaid expansions. But when you're paying somebody 39% of cost, if those 900,000 people that you saw would now be covered under ACA, if it's adopted by our state, if that takes place and the legislature imposes 10% additional cuts, we are no better off than we are today. It totally wipes out the benefit of the 39% that we're getting for those 900,000 additional people. We have other challenges with regards to um, uh, federal disproportionate share. Uh, uh, the ACA cut uh, other federal types of uh, funding to hospitals, and it's not, it's disjointed from whether the state expands the Medicaid population or not. It, uh, it, uh, it's, these cuts are going to take place unless they go back and uh, amend them, even if Florida should choose not to expand Medicaid. And we have uh, something uh, called a low income pool, which uh, generates about $62 million a year for Shands Jacksonville, which will, um, uh, which is sunset in a year. And it, while it could be re-implemented, uh, there's no guarantee. It's a federal waiver that we receive. Last slide I want to mention is, and Dr. Wilson mentioned this, th th this is, this is the, the hidden earth, the, the earthquake that most people are not expecting. Not necessarily what this slide says, but our shortage of physicians in this state, in this country, and particularly Florida. We have uh, relative to our population, a very small, we're very much underrepresented in the number of GME slots we have to our population. And if you looked at the age of our physician population, we, most, most uh, studies show a crisis developing in the very near future. Um, we have, a, and it's very critical, one of the things that the safety net hospitals do that we talked about at the beginning is they're primarily also the provider of and working with their med school partners, uh, the, the providers of graduate medical education in this state. Well, that's not free. And, in, and it's different at each institution, but at Shands at Jacksonville, they currently have 273 residents and the estimated loss per resident after all the governmental funding is provided, which is, doesn't cover cost, it's about $117,000 uh, a, a deficit per year per resident or $32 million a year. Um, lastly is just a slide that um, um, talks about Florida is, uh, while it's expensive, Medicaid is an expensive program, it, it is really one, it, we're one of the cheapest states in the country. Our cost per patient is about $436 a month, uh, but I'm not sure I want to brag upon that because one of the reasons we're the cheapest states in the country is because we pay providers so little. And so not all states pay their providers as poorly as Florida, and that's one of the main reasons we show up cheap. I know that we have other speakers, uh, Dr. Coble and I will Hopefully, it didn't go over my time limit too badly. Sure.